Hello and welcome to Chapter 5 Lecture on Membrane Structure and Transport. Uh, biological membranes, we're going to be talking primarily about uh, cell membranes. Biological membranes are uh, made up of phospholipid bilayers. So we have these phospholipid molecules. We learned about those in the uh, macromolecules. They're a class of lipid. Uh, phospholipid molecules are known as amphipathic. This term means that one side of the molecule will be polar and the other side will be nonpolar. This also can be referred to one side as hydrophobic, water-fearing, or nonpolar, and one side as hydrophilic, or water-loving, which would be the polar region. Uh, in cell membranes, the way that these uh, phospholipids are put together, they have hydrophobic tails. These are the fatty acyl or fatty acid tails. They are big, long hydrocarbon chains. And these fatty acid tails are attached to a glycerol uh, head molecule, excuse me, that also have a phospho, uh, phosphate group attached to them. And the glycerol head is the hydrophilic region or polar, and the uh, fatty acyl tails are the hydrophobic water fearing or nonpolar region. And in a bilayer, the two fatty, the two sets of phospholipids face each other with uh, the fatty acids facing inwards, and then on either side of the membrane, uh, facing both the extracellular space and the intracellular space are the uh, hydrophilic regions. So a molecule that is both polar and nonpolar at the same time, or hydrophobic and hydrophilic at the same time, is referred to as amphipathic. In addition to these phospholipids being kind of uh, jammed together in this bilayer, membranes also contain multiple proteins and carbohydrates, as well as some sterols or other classes of lipids for stability. The cell membrane itself is referred to as a fluid mosaic model, and this is because those phospholipids can rotate, they can move around. Uh, some proteins that are what we call integral proteins or proteins that span all the way across the membrane may have some flexibility as well. Sometimes attached to the polar region of the um, phospholipids might be a uh, sugar chain, so that would be referred to as a glycolipid. Sometimes proteins that are attached either integrally uh, throughout the membrane, what is sometimes called transmembrane, um, or a, what we call a peripheral protein attached to one side or the other of a membrane. They can also have sugars attached to them, and those are referred to as glycoproteins. But all of these different molecules that make up the, the cell membrane, there is fluidity. Um, it's a mosaic because it's made up of proteins and lipids and sterols and all of these different types of molecules. Uh, but some of these molecules have the ability to move freely or laterally throughout um, the membrane. So they move in this kind of um, horizontal type uh, movement. Uh, in order to move vertically across the membrane, then uh, usually energy or some kind of transporter is going to be required. So these, uh, the membrane has fluid-like properties, uh, but some of these uh, molecules can also be used for anchoring. So we have multiple different, um, different molecules that makes it a mosaic, and of course it's fluid because some of these can move. So here we have an example, um, just to show you up here on the left. These are referred to as the two leaflets. So these round areas right here, these are the glycerol, or what they call the glyco, uh, glycolipid. This one has a sugar attached to it. But all of these brown circles here, these are the glycerol molecules. This is the phospho part of the lipid. Uh, these long brown tail-like structures, these are the fatty acyl tails, or the hydrocarbons. Down here is a much better... Um, much better diagram of the actual molecules themselves. You can see the polar regions on the, this would be like the extracellular surface down here at the bottom on this layer is the intracellular surface. And then in the middle is this nonpolar area where the two sets of fatty acyl tails will kind of close up onto each other. Uh, this keeps the membrane in what we refer to as a semi-permeable state. So molecules that are polar are able to approach and even uh, kind of stick to the surface of this membrane, but they can't freely pass through because the center of the membrane, the inner leaflet area here, uh, the center of the membrane is nonpolar, and so those polar molecules can't move through freely. Same thing occurs with nonpolar molecules. If a nonpolar molecule is approaching the cell membrane, it may be repelled. It can't get near the polar region.
uh, so it won't be able to move across the membrane freely either. So this means that our cell membranes are semi-permeable. They have permeability to some really small molecules, um, gases, those sorts of things, a few inorganics. But for the most part, if something needs to be moved across the membrane, it's going to have to move through one of these over here on the left, these big purple areas here. This is an integral membrane protein. So this is a protein that, that spans all the way across the membrane. Uh, peripheral proteins are going to be bound to one side or the other and these proteins are what we looked at when we looked at receptors um, receptors are a class of integral membrane proteins they are also sometimes and makes more sense to call them a transmembrane protein so integral proteins are your transmembranes. These are the ones that uh, one or more regions are actually embedded throughout the membrane, so they actually span both sides. There are a couple that are referred to as lipid anchors. Um, lipid anchors have covalent attachment um, of a lipid molecule to an amino acid uh, chain within a protein. This means that the protein itself is anchored. It is not necessarily able to move freely throughout the membrane. Transmembrane uh, proteins do have the ability oftentimes to move. Uh, lipid anchors do not. Then we have peripheral membrane proteins. These are found on one side or the other. They're usually not bound by covalent bonds, more uh, hydrogen bonding and ionic bonding uh, through uh, the different charges of amino acids that make up our proteins. They're non-covalently bound, um, and these guys are usually found on the intracellular side, bound to another protein, and they will, um, or to uh, uh, the phospholipid head itself, and they are sometimes used in cell signaling. So they'll be attached until something happens, the cell receives a signal, then it will detach from the intracellular side and move into the cell to carry, um, carry out part of a transduction pathway. So here we have a transmembrane protein, you can see here. Now we have a lipid anchored protein, so you can see this protein is stuck here to a specific lipid molecule, a phospholipid molecule. You can see here a peripheral membrane protein, it's actually attached to this transmembrane. Um, and when this transmembrane receives a signal, this peripheral will probably detach or carry out some, some uh, pathway. This is the intracellular cytosolic side of the cell. <clears throat> Close up here, they're showing you this structure of a transmembrane. This actually happens to be a GPCR since we already looked at those. If you take a look at these two here, this looks a little like a GPCR receptor uh, makeup. And GPCRs, G protein coupled receptors, are made out of eight alpha helices. So you can see we have one through seven here, and then number eight is up top here. Um, and uh, alpha helices are most often used for. Uh, to build proteins that are going to span across the cellular membrane. They put together specific amino acids that are going to be uh, like this region here, they're right here in the uh, non-polar region of the, the layer. And then on the outside, these areas here are the polar regions. So this uh, semi-fluidity allows individual molecules to be in close association with each other, but if they need to move, they're capable of moving. Uh, some proteins may be semi-fluid. Some membranes um, are, uh, consist of lipids that can rotate freely along their long axis and move laterally, but they can't necessarily flip-flop back and forth. Uh, phospholipids that do flip-flop, sometimes from one leaflet to the other. Remember, the leaflets are the two layers. So if we want to move some phospholipids from the inner leaflet to the outer leaflet to increase the density of phospholipids on one side, we can do this, but it doesn't occur easily. It actually requires energy and a very specific enzyme referred to as flippase. So here we have a diagram showing lateral versus flip-flop movement. So on the left, phospholipids are, are free to rotate, uh, to go through a ro rotation motion so they can spin. They can also move from one part of the membrane to the other, but within the same leaflet. So they can't just leave that leaflet. Should this uh, leaflet down here in the intracellular side require more phospholipids, then this enzyme here, flippase, is going to use ATP to make that happen. Because this enzyme here is going to have to move this non, this uh, polar region of this phospholipid through the entire non-polar region of the membrane. So that's going to require some energy. <clears throat> 
There are several different factors that affect how fluid-like a cell membrane is, um, and cell membrane fluidity does change in a single cell over time. How long are the fatty acial tails? The shorter the tails, uh, the less likely they are to interact with each other. Think about um, whether like holding your fingers together and uh, you have just the tips of your fingers, which would uh, have very little interaction and that would allow uh, the fingers to move very freely. Or if you put the fingers together more tightly, then you're gonna see the longer those acial tails are, the more they interact, the harder it is to move those tails freely. So shorter acial tails result in a more fluid-like membrane. Remember, these are the fatty acial tails, these red lines here. So the shorter they are, the easier it is for these molecules to move back and forth and have that fluidity. If they're really long, like they are here, much longer, then these guys are kind of stuck together and the, they do not move laterally as freely as they do over here where they're shorter. Sometimes fatty acyl tails can have double bonds. Remember when we talked about lipids in the triglycerides, they can be saturated or unsaturated. And unsaturated uh, fatty acyl tails uh, can cause a kink. This is why your plant uh, oils are liquid at room temperature and uh, animal fats are solid. If there is um, unsaturated fatty acyl tails used, it causes this kink because of the double bonds this is going to make the layer more fluid-like because these guys can't pack together as tightly. Think about it, we have a whole bunch of straight tails. We'll go back to the diagram here. All of these tails are very straight. They're not really bent that much. So they can interact with each other and really pack together closely. But if they have a lot of bends to them and kinks in them, then they cannot pack as, together as closely and the membrane will be more fluid because the phospholipids themselves can move more freely. Finally, the presence or absence of cholesterol plays a really big role. Now, cholesterol is another form of lipid. It's in the sterol family of lipids. And uh, cholesterol uh, is a really big molecule. Um, how much is actually present in a membrane um, and the effects of that cholesterol on the membrane will depend on temperature. In, um, uh, 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 cholesterol is used mainly for stability. So in cooler temperatures, cholesterol levels may rise in cell membranes, and in warmer temperatures, cholesterol levels will uh, decrease for, uh, to uh, help with um, stability. Here's just an example of some lateral transport there. This is uh, from the textbook. It's just a case study where they took some uh, mouse proteins from one cell and they have a human cell that also has its own proteins. So in this diagram, the mouse proteins are green and the human uh, proteins are red and they fuse the two cells together. And when they did this and, and uh, fluorescently tagged them, they saw that the human cells were on one side of the cell and the mouse cells were on the other, which you would expect when you fuse these two together. Now, when they kept the temperature low and added a uh, fluorescent label, and like in fluorescent microscopy, when they looked under it again, they could see the mouse, um, the mouse proteins on the left here, all kind of together and close. But if they raised the temperature, then all of a the sudden, these mouse proteins were able to start moving all throughout the cell membrane. That fluid mosaic model uh, really started to play a role. Um, this lateral movement shows that that these um, proteins can move freely throughout a cell membrane. But not all membranes that are integral have the ability to move. Some of them are actually restricted or anchored. They are, um, oftentimes can be bound to elements in the, cyto in the uh, exoskeleton or in the cytoskeleton. So if they're bound to the cytoskeleton, then the protein cannot move laterally throughout the membrane. Um, it's there for, um, it is anchored in the cytoskeleton of the cell. Other integral proteins may be bound on both sides. They could be bound to the intracellular side on the cytoskeleton as well as in the extracellular matrix. Um, this would allow for anchoring of the cell in position in a multicellular organism. Um, our kidneys do not float around freely. They are, they are in a very sp specific place. And that is because many of the integral proteins that make up those, um, those kidney cells are anchoring the cells together in order to form the matrix that makes up the, uh, 
the shape of the kidney, as well as anchoring the kidney into place. There are ligaments and regions that hold the kidneys in place so they don't just float around. So all of that anchoring occurs even on a single cellular level. So here is the extracellular matrix, and you can see some of these proteins, they may not be used necessarily for signaling. This one here could be used strictly just to anchor the cell to this extracellular matrix so that the cell itself stays in one place, um, and these cells are going to anchor to each other. Some of these proteins will cause them to anchor to each other. Uh, and then, of course, here we have an integral protein that is bound to both the extracellular matrix as well as um, the cytoskeletal filament here so that um, the, the cell is well anchored in, in place. Glycosylation. We talked about this process in, uh, when we discussed the endomembrane system. Remember, glycosylation is the addition of a carbohydrate to either a protein or a lipid. So if it's added to a protein, it's referred to as a glycoprotein. If it's added to a lipid, it's a glycolipid. These um, uh, sugar molecules are usually chains of sugars. It'll be multiple um, uh, uh, monosaccharides all attached in chains in very unique and um, distinguishable structures. They're used as recognition signals, so other cells that may be roaming around or coming into contact will know, so it's some type of recognition for other proteins. Um, it plays a role in cell surface recognition. It's kind of like a, sticking up a little flag that says, hey, look at me, I'm a, I'm a, a pancreas cell. It can have protective effects if there are lots and lots and lots of uh, sugars attached to the outside and it, the or, an organism starts coating itself. Uh, this is referred to as a glycocalyx. A glycocalyx is a really sugar, kind of like an outer outer coating um, on, the, on the cell itself and it's protecting itself from um, outside, uh, outside forces. Here we have a glycocalyx. Um, this looks like it's on a uh, perhaps uh, uh, some type of uh, protist. So we have our glycocalyx, that's this dark black area here that's made out of sugars. Here's the cytosol and here's actually a nucleus right here. We see this in uh, dinoflagellates, uh, diatoms, they do silica as well, some algaes and some protozoans. Freeze fracture electron microscopy is a special form of microscopy, microscopy excuse me, that's been used to map cell membranes. And what they do is they freeze a cell in either liquid nitrogen or some type of frozen acrylic. And then they kind of smack it real hard. And um, what this does is it causes the membrane to fracture into the two leaflets because the... Um, uh, the phospho, the nonpolar region the, where the fatty acyl tails face each other uh, is the weakest point of the membrane. Oftentimes the membrane will fracture into two separate leaflets and they can then map those leaflets and determine which proteins are integral and which proteins are peripheral. So we'll take a look. Here's a freeze fracture. So they have the P face and then they have the E face, right? So the E face is extracellular. And you can see some of these proteins are integral uh, and some of the proteins are peripheral. And this is just an electron micrograph. So here's your P face and here's the E face. You can look at all of these, of the, all of these um, integral type uh, proteins. So selective permeability. Um, like I said earlier, that phospholipid bilayer really um, allows for the selective permeability of membranes. Uh, and this selective permeability is really important for cellular function. It makes sure that only molecules that are essential are able to come into the cell. The cell is very selective about what enters and what doesn't. And if a cell does not have a transporter, uh, a protein transporter for a particular molecule, then and that molecule is not necessarily going to be able to diffuse freely across the membrane. It also makes sure that uh, metabolic intermediates stay inside of the cell. 
when we get into metabolism, we'll see that um, molecules go through many structural changes during metabolism. And we wanna make sure that each of those structural changes, we need those molecules to stay within the cytosol or even within a specific organelle during metabolism in order to gain the most energy from those molecules. And we don't want them to just kind of freely be able to diffuse out of the cell. We would lose the ability to capture their uh, potential energy. Of course, we need to um, allow waste products to exit and we want to keep our intermediates in. So we are selective not only about who comes into the cell, but also their selectivity on what leaves the cell. So that phospholipid bilayer um, amphipathic property or polar region versus nonpolar region is what allows for this selective permeability. Because the interior portion of the cell membrane is hydrophobic, it's a pretty strong barrier and it doesn't allow the movement of many molecules to move across freely. If they do move freely, they have to be really, really small. So that brings us to the idea of transport. Um, we have diffusion. Diffusion is a form of transport where um, a solute, something that's dissolved in usually water, um, a solute is going to move from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. And passive diffusion is just simple diffusion across a membrane. There is no transport protein associated with that. So think water. Um, water is able to move fairly freely across our cell membranes, not totally. Um, it takes a little bit of work. Uh, but, um, and we do have some transport proteins, so we can have passive diffusion um, or um, uh, uh, aided type diffusion. The size of the solute itself is what's going to cause it to vary in its ability to penetrate um, across the membrane. So here we have a cell membrane. We're going to go from high permeability to low. So you can see gases that are really, these are tiny molecules into O2. Of course, it's important that it's able to diffuse freely, CO2. These can diffuse very freely, uh, pretty freely across the membrane themselves. They're uncharged, right? They're, they don't have any charge. So this allows them to move freely through this nonpolar region. They're very, very small. Um, and uh, usually in high concentrations. Notice ethanol is one of these as well. Moderate permeability would be water and urea. Urea is a major component of urine and it's a, a large um, volume cell, cellular waste. Uh, low permeability would be glucose. These are organic molecules um, that are polar, so they need some type of protein to be able to move them um, freely across the membrane. Very, the lowest permeability are usually polar molecules that have a charge. Um, the charge, re and when you have this extra charge on it, think about it, this non-polar region in the middle, um, it's non-polar, it's uncharged, hydrophobic, so it is not going to accept um, any type of molecule. And these are very, these are smaller, right? These guys are, these ions here are smaller than even the gases that diffuse freely, but that charge on there is going to make a big difference and prevent them from, from moving freely. Then of course you have very large molecules. Uh, mac our macromolecules do not diffuse freely. Those are really big. So the bigger the molecule, the less permeable the membrane will be to it which means that cells are capable of maintaining concentration gradients. And there are two specific types we're gonna look at. The transmembrane gradient is where we just have a high concentration of solute on one side um, and a lower concentration on the other. And this is going to cause these solutes to wanna to carry out diffusion to move across that membrane from an area of high concentration to low. Then we have what's known as an ion electrochemical gradient. This is where um, we have a charge difference across the membrane and the charge difference is created because of ions. So we have a high concentration of ions on one side and a lower concentration of those same ions on the other and this creates an electrochemical gradient. We briefly discussed this when we talked about um, uh, heartbeat and the uh, calcium ion channels, the movement of those calcium ions back and forth across, across the sarcoplasmic reticulum, allowing for an electrical charge and that electrical charge causing the heart to beat. So that um, 
ca the, those calcium ion channels with the troponin and, and the lambin, all of that is due to, is created to create this elect ion electrochemical gradient. Those are calcium ions. And it's, they, were, they are used to create this electrochemical gradient so that there can, um, we can build up an, an electrical charge. So transmembrane gradients and ion electrochemical gradients are very important in um, cellular function, in total cellular function. And we'll see a few examples of those. So that's the end of lecture one. Uh, we are going to finish uh, chapter five in lecture two. I'm just trying to keep it in, um, in two small, smaller increments so they're a little easier to go through. Make sure to write down any questions that you have and bring them to our lecture class so I can answer them and we can uh, review. See you in part two.